was a, a young assistant professor in the late 1970s, this uh, great thing happened to me. I was, uh, I heard from this uh, professor in my field at Oklahoma State University that there was this great student that uh, was graduating from there and that I should try to recruit to the University of Texas at Austin, where I was at the time. And uh, that student was Jesse Ruzel. And I offered him a research assistantship, and fortunately, uh, one of the best things that can happen to a young faculty member is to have an absolutely amazing student who far surpasses you both as a student and, and in no career. <laughs> so Jesse, Jesse got his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin and then was on the faculty at the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign. And uh, he's been at the University of Michigan since 1987, where he's the Jerry and Carol Levin Professor of Engineering. Um, he is uh, an unusual faculty member in the sense that he's absolutely good at everything. He's a great teacher. He is, he's done a lot of work that's very theoretical, but as you'll see, he applies this theory to very real applications, in this case robots. He also jointly holds 16 patents dealing with emissions reduction in passenger vehicles through improved control system design, and he's worked with various companies um, in, in Michigan, uh, various automobile manufacturers. Um, his work on bipedal locomotion has been the object of numerous plenary lectures and, and has been featured in many magazines, television shows. Um, another thing that can happen is your former student becomes much more famous. <laughs> I've never been on ESPN or CNN. Jesse has been on all of these. Um, and from, a, from an intellectual point of view, he's also won many awards in the IEEE Control Systems Society. He's a fellow of IEEE, a, a Bodhi lecturer. Um, he's a highly respected member of our, our profession. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Jesse Bissell, who's going to tell us what he's been doing with robots and how he applies um, feedback control theory, in particular nonlinear control, and very interesting. Jesse. I think the smartest thing I can do right now is not say a word. <laughs> it's a very high opinion of me. It's a nice sunny day, let's go. So I was a pretty raw product when I showed up at the University of Texas at Austin. I mean, I grew up in a town that had, had, that had 1,200 people. And we lived outside of town, okay? <laughs> so when I showed up at Texas, I mean, Austin was only 400,000 people at the time. It's over a million now, but it was a culture shock. I thought that was the height of civilization. But what really happened is that Steve introduced me to this much broader civilization that I didn't really see at Oklahoma State, which is just the world of uh, scholarship. And he had plenty of visitors coming through all the time. We were always challenged to think and read new papers ahead, ahead of the visitors uh, coming in. And for you PhD students who are working on projects, and those of you who are hoping to come working on projects, it really was better in the old days. Steve's funding was such that I could work on anything I wanted to. And he just encouraged me to follow my ideas, and I think that's what gave me the confidence to go on and follow new ideas as a uh, faculty member. And what I'll share with you is one of the ideas that came to me a long, long time after getting started as a, as a uh, researcher. So Steve Mantle did a lot of theoretical things, but if you do those things and you just kind of store them in the back of your memory, and I took some abstract mechanics courses, but I never did really any mechanical engineering, when you come to those problems, you can relearn the material much more quickly if you've been exposed to it than if you've never been exposed to it. And what Steve kept encouraging his students is to always read and learn beyond whatever the topic that you happen to be doing. So Steve, you are a mentor beyond all mentors, and Thank you. So I'll talk about bipedal uh, locomotion. This got started due to my wife. She was on sabbatical in Strasbourg, and so I said, hey, I'm going to Strasbourg with you. 
I had no plans. I was at a point in my life where I wanted to do different uh, things, and there was a group there starting a project to control a bipedal robot called Rabbit, the one in the uh, middle. They didn't have anyone in nonlinear control on the team, and so I took on the job of doing that. So I started off with just these little toy robots that you see on the right. Very simple mathematical models, and then we've gone through increasingly increasingly com complex machines. I'll primarily talk about Mabel, the robot on, the, on, your, on your right. I'll finish the talk with some very preliminary work we have on our latest robot, which is named Marlo. And Marlo is a freestanding robot like you're used to thinking about a robot. You'd be able to walk around like you and me without being attached to a bar. Here we go. So here's Mabel, she's a meter, a meter tall at the hip. I refer to her as a sheep. 65 kilos, so roughly human size and human weight. It was designed by Jonathan Hurst when he was a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. He's now an assistant professor at Oregon State. I recruited two fabulous graduate students on there. Council Shreenath is now an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon in, in robotics, and Haywon Park is a, a postdoc at uh, MIT. So if you get a team like that working with you, great things can happen. There's been a lot of contribution by Ben Morris, Giannis Pulakakis, and Ali Reza Ramazani. So, Mabel. Mabel is constrained to a boom. So this is a, still a simplified robot. It's a scientific machine. We're trying to understand the mathematics of balance. What we want to do is give the mach a machine the ability to walk around in unstructured ground, just like you and I can, without watching our feet. Um, the robot has, has no feet. It's walking on tiptoe, so it's either like a ballerina en point, or a very unfortunate individual who couldn't afford to buy prosthetic feet, okay? The special thing about it is that the robot has these very large springs, and we'll see that that helps it have a very agile, bounding, lipid gait. If you guys want to sit, there's plenty of seats around. I, I don't get distracted with people moving. It's all perfectly fine. Uh, the robot does not have a camera, so there's, there's some stuff going on. I will, will remind you of that. We're really trying to have it able to withstand some very uncertain um, changes in the environment. It has encoders. These are just devices that allow it to measure the relative angles of joints. Okay, so it knows the knee angle, the elbow angle, it has arms, etc. Knows the angle of the body with respect to the uh, to the uh, world frame, and then it has has contact switches in the feet so that it knows for the ends of the legs. So it knows when it, it has uh, has struck the ground. So that's it. No hearing, etc. So here's some of the stuff the robot can do. We can walk really slow, which is actually very hard, by the way. So there's about 0.3 meters per second. There was a while when it was the fastest walking robot in the world. It's no longer. This is just showing that obviously we're not planning where we're, we are throwing these boards. It can run up to 3 meters per second, which is equivalent of a 9 minute mile, which is pretty good. And it's graceful. So just look at how much clearance there is between the feet and the ground and how long it stays in the air. Okay, so it's just like a, well, just like you and I would like to be. <laughs> now on our videos, we almost always include a scene where the robot falls. And it's because of why. Everybody says, well, the robot's connected to the boom, so the boom is holding up the robot. Right? Wrong. Okay. So what is the boom doing? The robot's hips can move forwards and backwards. The knees can bend up and down. So it can move up and down and sideways, etc. But if the hips do not move in the outer plane. So if I'm leaning sideways and I can't step sideways, I fall, and the boom keeps that up. So it keeps it upright laterally, but not from falling down forwards or backwards. Okay. So it's a simplified machine in the sense that this degree of motion is removed. But otherwise, it has all the complexities of normal human walking. So what I'll do in this lecture is talk a little bit about why bipeds. I'm assuming everyone here loves robots. I don't have to justify robots. Exactly. I'll be very brief about that. I'll give a little bit of history of some of the cool things people have done in the area. And then we'll do some technical stuff. There's some mathematics behind this. 
I try to make it mathematics by pictures as much as I can. Okay. There'll be more videos of experiments, and then we'll wrap up with preliminary stuff on Mars. Okay. That's the plan. So white bipeds people, so if you look at modern prosthetic limbs now, they are no longer these simple wooden things that you have in the uh, pirate movies, okay? They really are, they really are just as complicated as any leg on a uh, robot. And it's even more complicated to do a, a prosthetic limb because you have all the complexities of the mechanical and electrical parts of the prosthetic limb, plus the uncertainty of the dynamics of the human body as it, inter as it in interacts with that. So one of the things I've always believed is that the work we're doing on bipedal robots, though simpler, can spill into the, the work on uh, prosthetic limbs. And that's recently happened for stuff that I do. And I was really happy about it because what I do is I tend to write my stuff and encapsulate it in a mathematical theorem. So mathematical theorem says under this and this and this type of, of situation, the following is always true. That's the beauty of math. And if you can write it in such a way that others can take their problem and map it onto it, then they say, oh, this and this is true, so in my situation, this is what's always going to be true. And that's what Bobby Gregg did. He was at the Chicago Re Re Rehabilitation Institute. He took a totally different phase variable that I use. I'll explain to you a little bit later in the lecture the notion of uh, mechanical phase. But he's got a very nice way of coordinating the knee and ankle motion and all the reports back from the, from the patients using that prosthetic limb is that it provides very comfortable use. Now, in that limb, you did not see an amputee. You saw one of the experimenters, and it's because, you know, when you set up your experimental protocols with your patients, it does not include showing the video to the world, okay? So the experimenters are the only ones who can do it, and that's why there was a special thing on the limb where someone with an able body could actually actually use it. Now, the other reason to do this stuff is it's just sheer fun. I mean, as great as the work I was doing with Steve as a graduate student and the nonlinear stuff I did afterwards, no one ever came and toured my lab to look at all the formulas I had on my yellow pad, okay? Never happened. Whereas here, I get groups of people in the lab every week. I've had Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, faculty, women's group. This was a group of students from Detroit where most of them had never left the city of Detroit before coming and visiting the lab. And it's, just, it's just marvelous the outreach you have for these, for these robots. And that's it, okay? Everybody happy enough that we continue talking about robots? We'll do it. Okay, so let's talk about a little of the history of the, of the subject. So the very first robots were extremely crude. It looked like an erector set. It probably wasn't <laughs> built from an erector set. It got a very static walking. You put one leg down and you move the other one really slowly and lean the body over, etc. The same group has since built a much nicer humanoid called uh, Wabian 2. The main control idea, the main no notion of how you organize balance was they have something called the inverted pendulum model, where you take the center of gravity, you know, that's the point where all your mass is equally distributed up and down the center of mass. And you make that behave like an inverted pendulum. So you, well, that, that's, the, that's what they're trying to do with their feedback control principles. Um, Honda, almost everybody's seen that robot. It's had a long line of development. It can climb stairs. It can run. Here's Honda running. Okay, here's in slow motion. See if you can see if, if the feet are off the ground. Okay, so apparently there you can slide a sheet of rice paper under the feet, okay? So it's about three milliseconds when the both feet are off the ground, where with Mabel it's 40% of the gait, and the feet are about six centimeters off the ground. So it's like a, a, a real run, but quite different, okay? Now I think this robot is capable of doing much more. The machine is actually quite powerful. It's the principles of balance and locomotion that are not being done well. What they use is something called the zero moment point method. The zero moment point is this. I mean, if you have an object on the ground and forces on it, you can calculate a point, the, a point where the force is being, where you can take all the resultant forces and collapse them into a single 
force. That's called the center of pressure. If the center of pressure gets here, then the foot's going to rotate on the toe. And if the center of pressure comes back here, it's going to rotate on the heel. So what they do is they keep the center of pressure within the sole of the foot and it doesn't rotate. Well, if the foot is on the ground, the rest of the robot looks like a standard manipulator. You change the ankle to get the shin where you want, you change the knee to get the thigh where you want, and you just work your way back, back through the chain. So it makes it a very simple control problem, but then you get this very robotic type walking. So we don't, we don't want to do that. So very different than this is work done in the late 80s at MIT by Mark uh, Rayburg. He built a series of hoppers, one-legged robots, that could balance extremely well, and then he extended it to bipeds, quadrupeds, etc. Now, if you don't know the name Mark Raber, you probably know some of his current robots. Everybody, anybody seen Big Dog? Yeah, Big Dog is amazing. Okay, it's one of the most amazing machines uh, out there. Raber built that. Yep. He also built Petman, and his most recent robot is Atlas, which will be uh, competing in the uh, DARPA, DARPA Robotics Challenge. So personally, I would not want to meet this robot in a uh, dark alley. <laughs> it walks really well. It's a totally amazing machine. It's a little bit unfair, but as soon as my students are trained sufficiently well, they graduate. He hires them, okay? <laughs> he keeps them. <laughs> It's just not fair. Um, he uses a control method he calls the spring-loaded inverted, inverted pendulum. So it's a little different than the inverted pendulum that was used at Waseda University. It's basically uh, predicated on doing foot contact just right. So he's got a, an algorithm that's heuristic, grounded in physics, for doing foot contact to keep the robot upright, moving forward, moving backwards. The problem with the algorithm is Mark Raper can get it to work on anything, and it works extremely, extremely well. And nobody else can make it work, okay? <laughs> it's not written down in a mathematical enough way where you can readily transfer it to things. That's the difference. But him, he's got a model in his brain of exactly how it works. It just hasn't been written down. Now the final different area I'll talk about just on some of the background is work by Ted McGear in the very late 80s, early, early 90s. He built robots that have no sensors, so nothing being measured, no actuators, so no motors and things moving, just links connected together by bearings and things like that. So you would think if you just took a couple of pipes and put joints together and turned them loose that it could never do anything as organized as a walking gate, and you would be wrong, okay? So Ted McGear showed that you could do stable walking without having any measurements whatsoever. Now they had to have a source of power, since they had no motors, gravity was the uh, source of power. They would walk down a uh, shallow slope. And you can buy toys, you can buy teeter-totter toys that work a little bit like that. But these are a little bit more, more sophisticated. Now Andy Ruina has taken this idea to its logical conclusion and built the, uh, the uh, Cornell Ranger. What he did was put little bitty levers on the ends of the toes and push off the robot at the end of the steps. So that, 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 uh, that uh, propels the robot forward. It is by far the most efficient robot in the world. It has walked 63 kilometers on a single battery pack. It is more efficient on energy use than a human being, as I'll explain in a second. Okay? It's an amazing machine, but I could take this pointer and put it in the, uh, um, on the path and completely trip the robot. Okay? It has no ability to raise its feet up. It can do nothing but walk on a flat surface really slowly, about 0.3 meters per second. But 63 kilometers is a long way. Those students are out there a long time on that track. Okay, <laughs> okay so let me try and kind of compare the stuff we have, and then we'll go forward with the work I've been doing on Mabel. So this is a chart that I've kind of made up on the um, y-axis or the vertical axis, I'm calling it um, the agility of the robot. 
totally qualitative, okay? Your notion of agility might be different than mine. On the bottom axis, though, I'm using a metric that the biomechanists use to be able to compare the energy efficiency of a mouse to an elephant. So these are things vastly different in size. What they're looking at is how much energy does it cost to travel a certain distance normalized by how much weight you are carrying over that distance. That gives you a dimensionless, a dimensionless quantity. And I'm going to normalize it so that the energy efficiency of a human is one. Okay, and I put Usain Bolt out there. <laughs> Not that running is more efficient than walking, but okay. So it's certainly clear that on agility, humans are high. The Cornell Ranger is slightly more efficient than a human in walking, but you know it, it has only one very limited gait, so highly non non agile. Now on the other extreme, we have big dog, pet man, Honda, etc. So big dog, very agile. You guys have seen it on the ice and things. I mean, it's just amazing, right? I mean, you just see that thing, you're just like, wow, I'm not worthy, okay? Mark Raybert's fantastic, but. Those robots use 20 to 30 times more energy per unit mass than a human does. They're very, very inefficient, so they're power-hungry beasts. This French robot I worked on uses roughly six times more energy than a human, but it's tied to a bar and it never could run, so I give it a C, half a plus maybe C grade. Maple, as you'll see, is pretty agile. It can't be high because it's still planar, running around in circles, but you'll see the agility is high. Its energy efficiency is roughly three times the use of a human. So you see this difference in types of things that these robots can do. And of course, what we're all trying to do is figure out who can build the next robot to interpolate in between Usain Bolt and, and those robots. Okay, so that gives you a perspective on what's, what, what's been going on and the range of methods that people have been using on these things. Okay, so I'm going to start talking about models of these robots, how we develop a mathematical theory of them. Once again, there's some seats over here if you guys want. I'm honored that everyone's here, but standing is not required. It's not going to bother anybody if you move. Okay, so walking consists of having one foot on the ground, we call single support, and then a transfer phase where you have, where you have two feet on the ground, which we will call double support. Developing the mathematical model of the robot in single support, there's this method called uh, Lagrangian uh, dynamics. We can write down differential equations for that. If you take your basic physics courses, you learn how to, you learn how to do that. Those models are pretty uh, straightforward. The double support, though, is different. This is when the leg that is not supporting the robot, we call that the swing leg, comes forward and then suddenly decelerates when it hits the ground. That's so there's a special type of, uh, of dynamics that goes with that. It's called uh, impact dynamics. Krishna has worked on this before. We're using the model of uh, her Muslu. And so what this does is it gives you an, essentially a jump in the uh, angular momentum of the robot. You get a jump in the velocities, but the positions don't change. And you put this all together, you get what's called a hybrid system. And hybrid systems, you know, you, you've heard about hybrid electric vehicles where you've got two sources of power and gasoline and batteries. So hybrid is a mixture of two things. Well, these are hybrid models that they mix continuous things like differential equations and discrete things like the jumps that happen at impacts. And when you mix things, it gets easier. It gets harder, okay? The so mathematics gets harder, but that's what gives us our jollies in the research community. Okay, so we can write down these, uh, these models in a form that they can be uh, simulated on a computer quite, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, readily. I was showing the models as being kind of simple, a single phase, single support, trans then, a, uh, then a switching in by the impact phase, but you can have much more complicated models than that. But for simplicity in the lecture, when I draw my picture of a hybrid model, I'll just consider one bubble, but you can do N bubbles. Okay, another piece of complexity of these models is how many actuators you have per the number of, of what's called degrees of freedom, the degrees of motion, the directions of motion that you have in the uh, model. 
So if a robot is has its foot flat on the ground and it has the ability to control the ankle and with, with the foot flat on the ground you control the ankle, you can orient the, the shin and then if they use, we use the knee to orient the uh, thigh, etc. That means for everything that can move you have an actuator, a motor or something that controls its direction, we call it fully actuated. So that would be, the, be the simplest case, you have lots of things controlling for each way you're trying to move. Um, it's a common assumption in the robotics literature. You see lots of papers doing that, but I consider it a very dangerous assumption simply because, like I was saying, if you just if you try to keep the center of pressure here to, in order to have the foot flat, it just takes a little bit too much force on the ankle and then the foot rolls up, it rolls backwards, or even worse, in 3D, you roll, you roll sideways on your foot. So if you have more ways that you can move that you can't actually control, because I can't control how fast I'm rotating about my toes, etc., the robot is called underactuated. That mathematics is even more complicated. But it's the type of mathematics I think is really important to develop if you're going to be doing formal methods of control for these uh, machines. We work on models that are underactuated. To make sure it's clear we're doing that, we usually work on robots that have point feet. But when you put feet on the robot, these are passive feet, like a, like a, a prosthetic limb with no actuation. I don't know, who's walking better there, Mabel? Or the uh, Discovery Channel cameraman, okay? So you can do very, very well. Another way that you get this under actuation in is if you add springs on your robot like, uh, like Mabel. So in between the motor and the joint that you're trying to move, you put a spring. What that spring can do is when you have an impact, it can store energy, it can compress energy just, just like a uh, pogo stick. And then you can save that energy for later in the game. This is a way of having higher energy, energy efficiency. And as you'll see, the ability to handle very large changes in the uh, ground height. Everybody with me so far? Basic, uh, basic properties of these models. Okay, so the idea is there's enough physics in this world, you can write down mathematical, mathematical equations of these robots, you can put them in a pretty nice form. There's certain properties in here that people in my area call feedback control systems know how to analyze. Now I want to show you how you can start using that intuition to develop feedback algorithms. So these are methods for or synchronizing the limbs and the robots in order to get a walking gait. So what, what I want to do is give you some feedback design tuition. We'll do a little bit of feedback design analysis. I mean, like really short, three minutes of hard math. And then some, some uh, calculation and design. <coughs> then we'll do lots of videos. Okay, start with, start with intuition. Now I'm going to do the intuition using a a, the work of Theo Janssen, who is a Dutch, a Dutch uh, kinetic, kinetic sculptor. Has anyone seen the, uh, the, uh, the uh, String Beast? Maybe you've seen him on Discovery Channel, etc. Okay, so here's a cartoon. So notice that there's a crank in the middle. There's, there's dozens of legs, hundreds of links there. So I urge you to go on YouTube and look at Theo Janssen and you'll find some wonderful, wonderful beasts that he's built. So these are mechanical systems where everything is synchronized by attaching links to a central crank that goes down the middle of the machine. Okay. All the joints are synchronized by a crank. So if Theo Janssen wants to change how his robot moves, he has to go in there, saw this limb a little bit shorter, weld it on, glue it on, etc. But it's, it's all a mechanical, mechanical linkage. Now these are physical constraints on the machine. So if he unconnects everything, it just wiggles all freely, okay, and then he's using these things to coordinate the motion of the limb, just like you use a chain on a bicycle to coordinate the front wheels and the pedal, etc. 
What we do is called virtual constraints, where we achieve relationships with joints by using sensing and feedback. So how does that work? So here's Theo Janssen's mechanism where all of the legs are connected to the central crank when it rotates the leg moves forward and backwards, etc. So imagine that you remove all of those connecting links. And then you put devices on that allow you to measure all the angles. So you put on their encoders and you add motors. And then you give yourself a feedback objective, adjust the output of the motor that makes the links on the robot behave just like they were connected physically to that crank. Okay, so you just, as the crank is going around, you could have the relationships that you had from the physical connections, use those as commands or desired values for the, um, for the individual joints in the robot, and you design your policy on your motor torque to drive your these variables y to zero and then asymptotically these two relationships become the same. So that's exactly what we do. Now on Theo Janssen's mechanism, he builds in a crank. It's very obvious that there's something to synchronize to. So on people or robots, where's the crank? Where's my crank? Okay. I'm walking, where's my crank? So here it is. We take the line from the support toe to the hip. And when you're walking, notice that that's monotonically increasing. And you take the next step, and it increases again. Take the next step, it increases again. So this is our phasing variable. We call it a gate timing variable. And it plays the role of a crank. So what we do is we synchronize the motion of the hips and the knees to this artificial gait timing variable. It's called a mechanical phase. So here's in the lab with the new robot Marlowe temporarily attached to a boom. The students are just moving the boom forwards and backwards. Can you tell whether there are gears inside the mechanism that are causing the legs to move back and forth or some other means of being done? From the outside, you can't really tell. But what's happening is we are measuring the angles of the knees and the hips, etc. And as the boom comes forward, the mechanical phase advances, and we just command this need to raise and lower, they push it back, and it just does the opposite. Okay, so just playing out this motion, if I, as the phase advances, I command this, the knee to bend, this leg to come forward, etc. So that's how it works. That's the basic notion. These are called virtual constraints. These relationships that could be done by gears, they're virtual because they're just lines of code. I'm telling I want the joint to go to this value, but if I want a different gate, I change the lines of code. Where Stale Janssen has to get out his hacksaw once again and his glue gun and really change the mechanism. So I can change mine on the fly. That's the best of big thing. Okay. Now, there's a, that's the intuitive idea. Turning that into something that you can publish, that takes some art, okay? We don't want to go through all of those details here. But let me just give you a reason that you need to go to the University of Maryland and spend some time in the math department and the physics department before coming either into electrical engineering or mechanical engineering to do this, okay? There's some really uh, fundamental um, technical stuff going on. So, I don't know if you noticed, when we're doing this, these virtual constraints, we didn't say anything about the fact that our model has this uh, switching behavior. We just said, oh, we have this mechanical system, and we never really paid attention to the fact that the foot hits, there's a jump in velocities, etc. But it's there. It's there. That's called a switching surface. It's a surface that has dimension one less than the ambient space the robot's model is living in. And you have to understand that solutions of this model are the robot moving its leg, 
until it hits the switching surface. You apply this impact map, then you get a new, a new solution of the mechanical models of the robot, etc. And what you hope to find on a periodic walking motion is that you start at some place and then return back. <coughs> Okay, so what we, this is what we have. We have some high dimensional space. Our solutions are living in, and we're trying to create these periodic motions. So the way we do it is we have our differential equations. We add in our virtual constraints. These are just relations on the variables. They create these beautiful low dimensional surfaces in our models, which is a way to remove complexity. We use some theory from the late 80s called, called uh, zero dynamic, Burns and Isidori were some very famous people working in our, in our field, okay? Now their theory does not really take into account this hybrid nature of these bees, and so what I've done and my students have done is basically modifying the Burns and Isidori theory to make it applicable to, to systems with switching behavior in them. So that's, in a nutshell, what we have done. And why it's beautiful is, this robot is really complicated. So like Mabel, you know, it's, it's living in a 12-dimensional space, if you can picture that, okay? 12 dimensions. This lower-dimensional surface that's really important is only four-dimensional. That sounds hard already, but four is much less than 12, and much less complicated to analyze. And this approach to doing feedback control allows me to do a divide and conquer approach and that I can design a controller to make my virtual constraints go to zero so I, I converge to this surface and then on that surface I try to design desirable dynamics. So this is what we do. And so Mabel, when you do this process, it ends up looking a little bit like one of Raybert's spring-loaded inverted pendulums. Except where Raybert had a point mass and an ideal spring, we have a distributed mass, distributed inertia. There's damping in the springs. It's a, it's a non-linear spring, but it's still a very low-dimensional model and possible to analyze that. On the French robot that I was first working on, in the late 90s and early 2000s, this model on this low dimensional surface is only two dimensional. Really easy to analyze. We could write everything down in closed form. It was just amazing. I mean, it's like, whoa, we got lucky. Um, and it is like one of those inverted pendulum <laughs> models that the group at uh, Waseda University was working on. Except once again, it's not a point mass, it's distributed, etc. But that's, that's what you get. <coughs> okay, and then there's all sorts of interesting mathematics you can look at for how you converge to these surfaces, but maybe it's not of too much um, interest to a lot of the crowd here, so let's, let's get that. But there's some quadratic programs and all sorts of fun stuff there. Okay, so let's now look at how we actually design these uh, synchronizing these synchronizing variables. So the first thing you have to do is decide what do you want to control on your robot. So for example, do you want to control the angle of the body? Do you want to control the angle of the body with respect to the legs? Do you want to control length of legs or do you want to control the angle of the knees? They're sort of the same but not exactly the same. What do you want to control? Do you want to control how much it acts like a pogo stick? What do you want to actually do on your robot? So that's a hard problem. I would say now that's still 50% art. We've done a lot of engineering on developing what to do, but it's still not... I don't have a theorem that says, if this is your robot, if this is your task, these are exactly what you want to control. We're not there yet. But you come to me and you say, this is your robot, this is your task, I'll give you some good advice. And 10 years ago, I couldn't have done that, so it's already much better. So I'm able to explain what we do a little bit later. So 
So on these virtual constraints that make the legs move backwards and forwards, etc., you have what you want to control, and I'll show on Mabel. And then you have some function of this virtual crank. So that's our gait timing variable. That was the angle between the toe and the hip on us. On Bobby Gregg's prosthetic limb, he was measuring the center of pressure of the forces as it moved on the foot. So what we do is we set up an optimization problem. So we set up something where we look at all the different possible evolutions of the, of the trajectories. Along those, we calculate for this trajectory how much control power would it take. Along this trajectory, what is the corresponding friction coefficient calculated so the foot required so the foot doesn't slip? Along this trajectory, what is the peak forces the motors have to apply, etc.? And then you can decide, well, I'll take two of these, one of those, and if it's Wednesday, I really like the eggs to be fried. Okay? So you, you set up a problem where you choose what you want the robot to do, and you write down an algorithm that sorts through all of these possibilities. That's basically what optimization is doing for you. And so we do that. What we do is minimize the energy that the actuators have to apply to the gate, divided by distance traveled. And we do that over these little low dimensional models, and it makes the optimization process pretty fast. <coughs> okay, so let's do this on Mabel. So let's remember something about Mabel. She has these very large springs. All of the motors, the gears, the transmission, they're all up in the body. So it makes the torso very heavy, and the legs are quite light. It has a complicated uh, transmission. There's a bunch of differentials. Well, this scared the heck out of me in the beginning, okay? So differentials, those are the things like in your car that takes the shaft and then divides the power to the wheels, etc. So it has all these differentials, but they're built out of cables. I'll turn it sideways so you can see it a little bit better. But this goes to the knee, essentially, and to the, and to the hips. So the very top part of this transmission takes a motor and a spring and it connects them in series. And then this part of the differential, what it does is effectively controlling the end of the toe and the hip as if it is a pogo stick. Then the other part of the differential is controlling the angle of this virtual pogo stick with respect to the body. So you can move it forward or backwards. That's what the mechanics of the robot is doing. So normally you would have a motor connected to the hip, a motor connected to the knee. Here, the motors are connected to the virtual line connecting the uh, hip to the toe, and then the angle of that virtual line with respect to the body. So they're controlling these kind of virtual things. And Jonathan set it up so it would act like a bouncing ball. Really. So what we do is we control the angle of the torso because it's very heavy. We control the rest point of the spring, whether it's compressed or expand it to bring energy in and, out, in and out of the leg, and then we control the angles of the legs. And this turns it into a very nice pendulum. Whoops. And this is what gives Mabel the ability to bound with this graceful, graceful wilting gait that is far different than the one millimeter clearance that Asimo has. has Okay, so that's how, that's how we do it. Let's just see this in action on a few different things. So one of the things we're really concerned is getting robots that can operate in environments that have imperfections in them. So we've designed our, uh, our, our controller to minimize all these fancy optimization problems, not requiring too much friction on the ground. We put a certain amount of clearance on the feet so we could go over obstacles. It would be a repetitive gauge, it's moving fairly fast, 0.9 meters per second. And so there's the basic walking gauge with Mabel. And what the students are doing is putting boards down in the path of the robot. So this is the very first time they've done it. My policy is if the robot is turned on, the camera is running, because you never know what will happen. Okay? 
So they're just putting things out. They're just, gonna, they're just seeing, can the robot handle obstacles? It's walking over them. So you, you get the idea. So I'm speeding up the video here. So why does it slow down when it steps up? Yeah, it's conservation of energy. That's what's going on there. Okay. Now watch this, watch this next one. Okay, slow motion is easier. So the top board slips. The stance blade goes backwards. Mechanical phase advances, so the other leg automatically advances because of the virtual constraints. Okay? It's the reflexes built in. We never even thought about that when we designed the controller. That hurts, right? <laughs> it's okay. It's a mechanical fuse. You know how your, your circuits in your house have breakers and stuff in them? We, we put a mechanical fuse in the robot, so if you get too big of a force, you don't want the knee to blow up. Like, you know, wouldn't you like to have something to give instead of your ACL? <laughs> and especially if it only took 20 minutes to put that other thing back together, wouldn't you really love it? It takes 20 minutes to put Mabel's leg back together. But okay, so what we found out is our basic controller, walking on flat ground with no modifications, can handle a two and a half inch drop off. Six centimeter drop, five and a half centimeters. Okay. So what's the state of the art in being able to handle uneven terrain? Well, there's two types of problems. Those where the changes in the ground height are known and those where they are not known to the robot. So if you're going upstairs, you kind of need to know the stairs are there. Okay. And so Asimo can go up and down stairs. Raybert had even done with Jessica Hodgson, some very nice hopping stuff, but they had cameras telling the robot exactly where the obstacles are. And then you have other types of experiments where Asimo is walking over some blocks here. Asimo is not told the blocks are there, okay? And so, okay, so now, now you want to come up with a metric for quantifying how big of an object these things can handle. Well, some robots are short, some robots are tall, you need to normalize these things. What we do is we normalize them by the length of the leg of the robot. Okay, that way if a robot is really small and you're doing an inch, that could still be 25% of the length of the leg, which would be very impressive for it. Where if you're a giraffe and you're doing an inch, it's not very impressive at all. We do that by the, uh, by the uh, percent of the leg. So the state of the art was about 6% of leg length. So if you're a meter long, it's 6 centimeters. So a little more than two inches. Okay, so I challenge the students that we're going to do um, a controller that can handle the following type of environment. Flat ground, walking up ramps, and then a step down where it's much greater than 6%. Okay, so the first thing they did was they tuned up the controller and they got it up to 8%. And they said, hey, we're better than the state of the art. I wasn't impressed. Okay? You said to tell them, no, that is not going to do it. That is not much greater than. That is just barely greater than. Okay, so I told Hei Wan, it was his project, I wanted the height of a U.S. step, stairs, okay? So eight inches, 20 centimeters. I said, that's it. It's kind of funny, I put that in an NSF proposal like three years before that, just picked that number out of the air as a target. And I completely forgotten about that, but I just said, hey, U.S. stare type. And he said, I'm going to do that to graduate? He didn't like it at all, okay? <laughs> so we started analyzing it, and we repeated those other experiments, and sure, every time we'd walk off about three inches, we'd break the leg. I mean, first time we thought all the pins, the plastic pins that hold it together were just worn, we're just replacing them. Second time is, well, just put a few extra pins in and then it'll stay together, right? No, it kept, the lake kept, kept, kept exploding. And it doesn't explode on the step down, okay? It's not the step down that hurts, it was the next step, if you go back and watch that video online. What happens is these robots have springs, 
They store all this energy. It's on the next step that an energy comes flying out of the robot, whips it forward, and just smashes the leg into the ground. Oh, that's not good. So his idea was, aha, let's turn the leg into a shock absorber. Put some damping in it and dissipate energy as much as we can. So with these virtual constraints, you can do anything you want. I mean, once again, if this was just mechanical linkages, you'd have to really go in there and undo a whole bunch of stuff and just put in shock absorbers and it worked for that one experiment, and it wouldn't be very, very general. So what we did was, Can I up here? please. So uh, if skeptical students may not have confidence in such a control alteration that will fix this and make a new virtual constraint whole. So the thing is that you need to proceed on the assumption that since you can do it with the real constraint with damping, there ought to be a control other than get the job done. Was that the idea? Yeah, so the student, so the question was, where did the intuition for this, for this come from? As uh, Hei Wan is a mechanical engineering student, not an electrical engineering student. And he understood how shock absorbers work in cars and things like that. And so that's where his intuition came from, that he said, I will build electronically the equivalent of a shock absorber. And so I will use equations in a computer that emulate the action of a, of a shock absorber. That's what he did. Okay, so the one thing that's different about a robot than you and me, when the robot steps down, you know, it knows exactly the angles of all of its joints. So as soon as its foot steps down and makes contact, it knows exactly the depth here. You and I can estimate it, but I mean it's fast, right? And we're, we're already falling down doing the face plan. So, but in one millisecond, we know exactly the height. Okay, so they said they set up another optimization problem where they would make sure there was no slipping and that we didn't exceed the maximum forces the motors could create, etc. We did all the mathematics. And then what our plan was, once again, remember, the robot can measure exactly how high it's stepping down. We would design several different types of shock absorbers. The basic one could do 5 centimeters. We do another one that can handle 10 centimeters, another one 15, another one 20. So this is 8 inches, 6 inches, 4 inches, 2 inches, okay? Surprise, you only need the base controller and the one for 20 because the base controller goes up to here, three inches, six to six point something centimeters, and the 20 centimeter one handles all the others. So it's a very simple controller. So here's the, here's the robot in action. Okay, that's seven inches. Excuse me, they've already pushed that in. That's eight inches there. It applies the transition gate for one step. And merrily goes on its way. So I should wrap up in about six minutes. Is that it, Steve? Or you know something like that? Okay. So here's another problem. So okay, so we mastered the stepping down. And the thing I forgot to emphasize: remember, Mabel does not have a camera. We gave her amnesia when she went up the ramp. She couldn't remember that the previous time that she had stepped off, etc. Okay. So this is just pure robustness observing the environment and taking the right reaction to it. But, you know, the thing that gets us usually is we're walking, we're talking to a friend, we're in the woods, and we trip over a root, right? The root's sticking up this far. It's not that we stepped in a hole that was 20 centimeters deep that gets us, it's that we trip over the stupid root, okay? So can we handle bumps that are sticking up like roots? Once again, with no... <coughs> with no cameras or anything like that. And I have to admit, I did not have any idea what we could do there. And this was the brilliant graduate student saying, I want to do this, OK? And I said, hey, let's, just, let's go for it. The motivation for doing it blindly, once again, I mean, this is a handy cam, a GoPro camera of a fireman, OK? What are you getting out of your vision system there? <laughs> so if your robot's going to go into rubble and dust, etc., it can't be getting from the vision system that there's a, a protuberance on the floor and it's exactly two inches high and I can step on it. Okay, so I just talked to some guys in vision and they said, well, 
those kind of situations, we can tell you maybe plus minus 10, 10 centimeters, plus minus 4 inches what it's going to be, and you'll be lucky if you get that. Okay, so I took that information back to, uh, to uh, Haywon. So we modified the robot so it could detect if it was a, if it was kicking into something. So it, did, it didn't have any nerves in the front part of the foot to start with. So you essentially put in the equivalent of you stubbing your toe. And you have a reflex that raises your foot when you, when you do that. So then we built that reflex into the robot. So we designed motion such that when you stub your toe, you either plant the leg and then raise the next one, or if it's late in the gait, excuse me, if it's early in the gait, you just raise it and go on. We designed some motions. We built what's called a finite state machine for the, uh, for the experts in here. And so we have our base controller, regular walking. We could step up on the platforms for tripping, stepping down off things. We had our trip response stuff. And we built this huge cyber physical system. <laughs> And we tested it like crazy on the computer. And so here's Mabel walking without any camera. No camera. Could you do that? <laughs> Me neither. Slow motion. It looks like she has eyes in her feet, which is actually a very good idea, but she does not, okay? Here's it, here's it again, so it's not just you know, a one-time thing. I missed it and did the entire step off, okay? So watch this. <coughs> Puts on the edge, and it doesn't even get the next step. It just misses it entirely, goes all the way down. We can handle, we can handle eight inches. Okay, so it looks wonderful. This robot can do anything. Except, you can't put combinations of objects to make it fall. And for the control experts in here, and this was my quandary, the problem I don't know how to answer yet is, do I need to redesign my basic tripping reflex motions? Do I need more robust controllers to put those in, or do I need entirely different motion primitives in addition to the ones I have in my finite state machine? So I, do I need new nodes in my finite state machine? Do I need new controllers in the nodes? Do I need new tr transition conditions for them? I don't have any kind of mathematics right now that helps me decide what I need to do next to make this thing better. Totally open. I have no idea how to solve that. So yeah, there's still things to do. Okay, so that's Mabel. Mabel's now retired. She'll be in the Chicago Field Museum starting March of next year. So that's pretty cool. The dean is very excited about that. Um, this is Marlo. Marlo is our new robot. So Mabel walking around in the boom. You know, I guess you can all. There's more things to do there, but sometimes you've got to start trying yourself on the full motion of the robot. So we got money from the dark side to do it, from DARPA. I mean, it's, fortunately, we have a wonderful program manager, Gil Pratt. So he was a former academic and treats people with a lot of respect. So it was a really nice experience in that sense. Um, Jonathan Hurst was uh, running the program. Assistant professor Hartman Geyer, another assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon, and me, the old, the old guy on the team. Our objective is to get a robot that's highly agile, energy efficiency. We want to fill in that square that I showed you between Mabel and uh, Usain Bolt and do dynamic walking. Ultimately, you should be able to function outdoors. We've got a battery pack, etc. It's a little bit lighter than Mabel, 55 kilos. Um, many more ways it can move. It has six actuators. The legs move, the hips move sideways as well as forwards and backwards. And they still do not have active uh, feet. It has these funny legs called a four-bar linkage. 
and these very large springs on there. So it's got inherited some of Mabel's physiology. Um, what do we sense? The angles of the joints. We have an inertial measurement unit, so it's essentially the equivalent of your vestibular system. So you can tell they're always leaning over this way or that way and turning and the speeds, etc. So that's it. We have extended our theory. We put prosthetic feet on the robot model and got it to walk uh, quite stably. Now we're trying to employ this controller on the robot. So this is where we're at now. Grad student humor. There's our GoPro. <laughs> well, it went farther than they thought, so the guy, the guy had to pick up the camera and walk backwards with it. Okay. <laughs> but ultimately, it's still not totally stable. It was walking about 0.65 meters per second there, and then. We just lost it and fell over sideways. Okay, so we're not there yet. Um, what we'll get is we'll get it walking stably 20, 30 steps the length of the lab, get outside a little bit, get enough data to improve the model, and then our mathematics will kick in. The model we have is very rudimentary at the moment. So um, that's it. Thank you for your attention.